Hello, everybody. We're going to get started shortly, getting people situated. Welcome. Hello, folks. Welcome as you come in. And how many faces I could see at one time. Oh, look at that. Hello. 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 <laughs> Glad to see some folks are doing video. That's always encouraging. I agree, Max. Right? Yes. So uh, uh, whenever uh, whenever it's good for you, Max, I'm I'm happy to kind of give you a brief introduction and then let you take a, take away the show. All right, sure. Let's launch. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, so uh, we are really thrilled to have um, Max Gutman join us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Max is a bold 10 under 10 award recipient and a graduate of uh, Harper College 08 and uh, CCPA, he got his MSW in 12. He's also the owner of Recovery Now, which is a private mental health practice. Through his work as a licensed clinical social worker, therapist and disability rights advocate, Max fights for those without a voice in various systems of care, such as the New York City Department of Social Services, the New York State Office of Mental Health, and the city's Department of Corrections. Gutman teaches graduate level social work students at Fordham University to be leaders in their practice. He is also the author of University on Watch, Crisis in the Academy, which he published under his pen name, Jay Peters in 2019, and Wales High School, First Diagnosis in 2020. He writes on his lived experience with schizophrenia, and he also brings his story to his work. Gutman is a well-published academic uh, author, and he's been published in academic journals and also blogs daily on his site, mentalhealthaffairs.blog, bringing his passion for mental health to consumers everywhere. He is also a board member at the newspaper City Voices. Max sits on the Consumer Advisory Board Committee for the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene in New York City. He also participates regularly with the Regional Advisory Committee for the Office of Mental Health as a peer advocate. So welcome, Max. We're really thrilled to have you back at your alma mater, even hey. though it's virtual right now. Um, so uh, thanks again for coming and speaking to our students. Hey, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I could say that a lot of that's true. Um, and um, I'm happy to be here, here, right here, and we do we do what we can. So let's do what we can today. It's it's a, a wonderful, well, it's cloudy out, um, but in this virtual library here, there are no rules, but learning, um, and we're going to learn today about the life of a prosumer. So let's get started, folks. Wonderful again to see each and every one of you. Um, it's gonna be a good couple hours, I promise. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Max, um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. This is gonna be a little brief introduction, a little of that bio that you got before, not so much of the prosumer identity yet. So what we're gonna to do today is I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself, a lot about myself actually, um, but in the context of how to think about your lives and your identities, because it's really about how you think about yourselves and how you think about who you are and what you want for yourselves in, in terms of your goals, in terms of what you do and, and where you take yourself. So a roadmap for today. I am a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I am, I like to think of myself as a social reformer these days. Uh, I didn't always think of myself that way. A lot of my life to date has been reforming this myself and uh, honing that and learning what I could do to be a healthier person for myself and for my clients and for everyone around me. Um, and what that means in terms of my life and your lives. And, and you'll see what health means. We'll talk about health later on. So that's me. Um, we're going to talk about my identity as a prosumer, what that is, where I've landed in terms of practicing social work, and the implications for you folks in terms of your own lived experience, because we all have lived experience, you may not have a diagnosis. 
um, diagnosis. Um, it may not, it may be subclinical, or or you may have been in therapy at one point in time, or you, you may not have really think about mental health a lot. Maybe just think about wellness and a more organic um, uh, way of thinking about you know health and living. But you know we all have stuff. So what you do with that stuff and how you think about that and how you represent yourself and disclose that is gonna have a profound impact on your career. That's something I believe uh, given my experience and my lived experience. So after talking about the implications for your life, we'll do a little discussion and we'll have some Q and A time. Now, judging by the facial expressions, oh, look, scanning, scanning. All right, we're still good. No one's, no one's, uh, yeah, no, okay, all right, very good. Anyway, so folks, my story. So I have a, I have a bit of a complex story and a complex relationship with Binghamton, um, a really complex one. So judging by the screen, you all see the screen, that is a, the cover of my book. Um, now, in the cover artist of my book, before I talk about what's in the contents of it, read it, and this was her representation of what she read. So she was actually a medical illustrator. So she's the artist herself is pretty adept at representing medical uh, stuff, comorbidities, medical problems, medical issues in, in, in art and in film. So my story. So I was a student at Binghamton University as an undergrad, I studied English um, and literature, uh, rhetoric actually. So for about three years, um, my life was relatively, relatively normal, uh, normal. I went to school, I had a good group of friends. I studied, my grades were up and down depending on the semester, depending on how much I partied. Um, or depending how much I took things seriously, maybe there was a class I really liked, um, my grades went up. The undergrad experience is what it is. Um, I really enjoyed it. When you're in it, you're in it, right? You don't really have another, another way of looking at it. But when I was in it, I was, I was in passion. I always wanted to go to Binghamton. Um, and, and, you know, aside from the depression and, um, subclinical and clinical issues I had in high school, I still always was collegiate bound. Um, and, you know, when I was in high school, it was, it was about figuring out, will I be in therapy when I'm in college? Will I not be in therapy? Um, but when I went to college and got situated up in Binghamton and got a good group of friends around me and started taking classes and it started gelling, you know, um, I was in and out of therapy. Um, it was, you know, when you live three hours away, I was, I live in Westchester, New York, or that's where my parents are from. Um, it's sort of hard to make connections with clinics in the long distance in terms of traveling. Are you going to be in therapy for six months, go home and not be in therapy? If you folks know anything about like how therapy works in mental health, you don't really switch therapists every six months. So the idea was, you know, go to school, make it work. So I tried to make it work. And for about three years, it was working. Um, I had relationships, I had fun. I did all the things like a normal college student would do. Um, and then in my last semester of college, actually right before it, I had this idea because all my friends were graduating. I'm like, hmm, what am I gonna do now? I have an English degree. What am I gonna do with that? All right, um, you know, I I didn't really think of myself as an author. A lot of my friends were going to law school with their English degrees. So I said to myself, I guess I'll go to law school. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I'm not really, I wasn't really ready to leave yet. Um, but at the same time, I really didn't know what to do. So I had this idea, apply for graduate school um, in English. 
um, and start being a professional English major. It seemed like the natural course of events, right? I enjoyed studying English. I made it work for three years. I was going to get a degree in it. Why not professionalize it? And, you know, I had some very passionate ideas about language. I really loved language. Um, and I said, all right, let's do this. So what I did was I went to the uh, my department and said, I'm going to you know, I'm going to do what I need to do to apply for graduate school. I was 19 credit short um, and I wanted to start in the spring. So I don't know if you folks know, but um, during a winter session, you only really have four weeks, right? So what I did was I had this idea. Apply for graduate school in the spring and take 19 credits during the winter. Now, Binghamton doesn't really allow, and a lot of schools don't allow you to take more than four credits during a winter session because it's four weeks. Even during the summer, four credits is a lot for one term. Um, so what I did was I found a loophole because at this point I was really, really sort of desperate to stay in school and 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 and, and, and you know moving up and. I was trying to really find my own, discover my own. This identity thing is starting to emerge, this theme you'll see. So, you know, it, in trying to find who I was and what I wanted for myself, I said, all right, let's do this. You're gonna, you're gonna plow through this winter session. So I found this loophole and this loophole is basically, you could take four credits at one school, but we're in the SUNY system. So, what you do is you take four credits in in um, different universities across the SUNY system, and then you transfer those credits in at the end of the winter session. So during this winter session in, it was 2007, I was taking classes at five, six different schools across New York State um, online in an empty apartment while all my friends were like graduating and gone. Um, I'm tied to the computer like this. Um, assignments are coming in left and right. Every hour there was another essay due um, for weeks at a time, for weeks. Um, and I don't know why this plan was approved. I don't know um, if, you know, like the director paid me lip service and said, just go do it and wants to be out of her office. But I had every intention of completing it, spent thousands of dollars to do it. It costs money to take winter credits, but it also takes energy um, and a certain amount of stimulation. Um, I needed to use all sorts of uppers at that time to stay awake for weeks at a time usually a span Monday through Friday, I was awake um, for five days. And, um, and then at the end of that time, I would have to get a good night's sleep or sleep for two days, wake up Monday, and just hope I woke up for that ne first assignment that next week. Um, but it was arduous. I needed to use special eye drops because I was in front of a computer for so long. I'll never forget that. It was the first time I needed a, a Waste in my eyes, but it, it was torture. It was it was self inflicted torture. Um, it was it was punishment, punishment that you know I would later understand as not not taking care of yourself and not planning the right way. All sorts of ways that this could have um, been handled differently. But make a long story short, at the end of that time. I found out I was rejected from the graduate school. So I had done all this work, taken all these credits across New York State in all these different schools. I had logins all over the room. I was I, I had a clipboard for when I was gonna take stimulants and not, so I didn't overdose. It was a whole medical academic thing going on. Um, but make a long story short, I was rejected. And um, that threw me back. It threw me back quite a bit because I had just done what I considered to be an insurmountable feat, something that people wouldn't even conceive of because they couldn't 
map out the logistics of getting all those credits in so quickly. So I was, I was pretty shocked um, and I was pretty upset. So that was the first, I believe, uh, loss and trauma and, and that, that threw me um, that set the course of a series of events that I like to call um, University on Watch, my book. Um, the book really talks about all the different crises that happened from that moment on to the point where I was hospitalized um, at the end of the semester. So a lot of things happened, a lot. Each chapter is another crisis um, because when, when you first experience schizophrenia symptoms, you don't know you're sick. Uh, there's a term for it. Um, and you don't realize what's happening as it's happening. People are, people will express concern. They'll say you're acting differently. And you're like, what, what are you talking about? So basically from that point on, um, you know, I, I was still in classes and um, I wasn't quite sure eventually who I was and what I wanted for myself. My, my identity as a, as a student sort of unraveled. Um, I, I believed at that time that I was in some sort of special flux where I wasn't quite an undergraduate student, but at the same time, I wasn't a graduate student. So I did all these little maneuvers to try to position myself in, ver in very precarious ways. I took cross-listed classes with um, graduate, uh, like graduate level, undergraduate cross-listed classes, because in Harper, in English, you can do that. And I put myself in proximity of professors that didn't want me um, in the department anymore. The same professors that had rejected my application. I took a class, it was called the History of Rhetorical Theory. It was with the chair of the uh, department at the time um, who approved my plan and who had rejected me. Um, and I thought, given the name of this course, the history of rhetorical theory and my precarious situation as a rhetoric student, that I was creating history in a sense, um, that what was happening was a part of the history of rhetorical theory for myself and for the English language. Um, as the semester unfolded, uh, I, you know, looking back, they call it prodronal symptoms. Um, but, you know, on a look back, it was as if I was not so much Max Gutman anymore taking classes and trying to figure out what he wants for himself. But this literary um, theorist bound up in history and illness and concern from the university, um, trying to alter language and, and at the same time contest the admission decision. So during this time, a few things happened. I won't go over everything that happened because uh, that's not really relevant, but I want you to understand the magnitude of it. So I wasn't allowed eventually in the department office. I was showing up there pretty regularly as you might imagine, with all my concerns and stuff happening to me. I was in that department office pretty often, asking questions, trying to figure out what to do. Am I gonna, what am I gonna do next year? What do I do now? So make a long story short, eventually they had enough of me in that office. And um, that was a problem because in order to register for classes back at that time, um, given my situation, I had to go in person. So eventually what happened was, eventually um, I was told I can't go in the office. I got into this interesting relationship with the University Ombudsman. I don't know if you folks have ever dealt with the University Ombudsman. Um, not many people do. Uh, usually that happens if you have some sort of strange, um, either judicial or social issue, um, or some sort of um, 
it's not a good situation if you're dealing with the ombudsman. You folks are social work students. You know, if you're dealing with these specialized services, there's stuff going on, right? So I was told not to go into the department office. And I'm like, oh, oh no, I got to register for glasses. So I went into the department office. And I'll never forget that day. The secretary of the department uh, picked up the phone and said, I'm calling the police. And I'm like, oh, what, what? Thinking I'm just registering for classes. They can't be serious. I walked out of the office and police showed up um, and they put me in handcuffs and um, walked me out of the Bartle Library Tower and um, in, walked me to the police vehicle, took me to the police barracks and chained me to a pole in the police barracks and started questioning me. What am I doing? Why am I doing this? What's my intention? Eventually, they left me on my own recognizance and just let me go. But at, at, by that point, I was so scared of the university, um, no longer asking questions and trying to figure out what's going on, but vi uh, visibly shaken and frightened of the school. Um, so that made things even worse when you're sick and you're afraid to get help, right? It's one thing to be sick and like needing help and going to get help. It's another thing when you're afraid to ask for it, right? From the helper. So that later became an article um, in um, the um, NAM, through NAMI, their advocate. It's a magazine they put out, a, like a little journal um, that they do. They did a three article spread of it um, that talks about that experience of um, that I that I wrote it, but they discussed, you know, being handcuffed and all that stuff. So, you know, I just want to you folks to realize each of these moments that I talk about um, eventually became also bound up in writing and self-reflection um, later on. And that article was published like a year ago or two years ago. But other things happened. I lived with a professor because um, I was afraid of my roommates at that point. Um, and they were afraid of me. So I lived with this professor who had been um, terminated from the university, another angry person um, who was also angry at the school. Bizarre story, okay? So remember I said that I was trying to figure out like how to take classes and which classes to take. Eventually, um, being that like I couldn't register for a certain graduate level English courses, I started to go seeking asylum in other departments. That was my idea. I was gonna seek asylum and either sit out the uh, faculty in the English department or or um, if I couldn't do that, um, what I would do is I would find like a safe haven in you know um, another another part of the university. So at that time there was they had the pick department. I don't know if it's still there anymore with philosophy, interpretation and culture which, um, you know, it's a, was an interdisciplinary program that also had courses that I was interested in because interdisciplinary studies intersects English at different avenues. So I said, all right, I'll take a class there. So I found a nice professor who let me in the class. Uh, it was a lot of mainly PhD students, doctoral students um, ready to defend their dissertation. Um, but what I did was, that first day I arrived at class, okay? There was uh, a, a, this lady sitting there with this pin. It said, think Binghamton on it, okay? She's just sitting there and we started talking and it was as if she like knew what my situation was. And I sort of had an idea of what her situation was. She was talking about a lot of the same faculty I had issues with. It was because she had issues with the university and it's a small town and everyone knows each other. I didn't know that at that point. But um, later after I left, um, you know, my living situation with my friends, I was, she invited me to live with her in her house. So there I was living with a um, discharged or terminated professor of strategic management on the other side of town um, in this Victorian house. Um, and totally, totally uh, a sharp departure from everything I knew, living on the west side and, you know, with, with students. And I was living with this angry, um, um, like, 
faculty member who had left who sort of uh, egged me on. But at the same time, she also nurtured me. Um, and, um, you know, there's the thing, right? When you're sick, right? This is a, a, a just a little learning moment. Um, you know, how do you help someone without like enabling them at times, right? When someone's sick, right? Let's say they have certain issues uh, that need to be dealt with. Well, you could help them to a certain extent, right? Before you're enabling them um, and, you know, furthering their illness in the sense that, you know, they also need to take ownership of what's going on. But in the sense that you want to help them, you sort of take a piece of that ownership. So she took a big piece of that ownership. By the end of the year, letters from my family were addressed in care of this professor uh, who had left. And she was sort of directing me in what to do and, and how to take care of myself in a very different way. Um, by the end of that semester, I was hearing voices, FBI, CIA, um, you know, I thought she was from the Belgian government. Um, you know, I thought I was living in the witness protection program house. Shortly after that, I was in the hospital. Make a long story short, it was a difficult year. Okay. That's the big, that's the big takeaway here. So I had a very difficult, difficult time, um, in my last semester as a student and I was very sick. Fat later found out it was just, I had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, first, first onset psychosis, um, first episode psychosis. And, you know, it was, I didn't make it very long in the community hospital before um, my symptoms were so severe that I needed a higher level of care. And I was punted up to the state hospital. I was in the state hospital for months, eventually after injections and treatment, um, you know, I experienced relief and I started to get better. But it was a long road. Um, you don't walk away from the state hospital ready to take on life. It just doesn't happen that way. Maybe you can walk away from like outpatient treatment or like, you know, acute disorders, you get better, you re-engage with life. You don't walk away from the state hospital, all right? and go back to school or, you know, um, do everything you ever wanted to do. My parents were basically caring for me for about two years um, after I got out of the state hospital, cooking for me. Um, my meds were so, so um, impactful on my level of energy and my cognition that I was so, so, uh, it was so hard to really stay awake and focus um, that they really need to care for me pretty significantly. Um, it wasn't until maybe a couple of years after of significant therapy and learning how to cope with these symptoms and um, the secondary symptoms and, 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 and negative symptoms that uh, I learned how to really basically uh, survive in the world. You know, it's interesting. Schizophrenia hits you right as your personality sort of develops, right? You go to college, you're sort of becoming your own, creating that identity for yourself. And that's what I thought I was doing. And then it hits you and then it sort of sucks that away. It takes that piece of you, that identity forming piece. And, and either you can walk away in two different ways. You can either become a victim of your illness right? Um, and, and sort of step into this learned helplessness um, situation where you're living off the system, the system is is giving to you and you're sort of like this back and forth, get better, get worse, system pushes you down, you rise up a little, but never really make it anywhere. Um, or you rise above it um, and learn how to really face the limits of your illness um, and become you know, and, and start charting a new path. So schizophrenia is, is one example of an illness that could do that to you. It could be anything, folks. It could be any devastating illness in your life, okay? That 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 could suck that that new exciting piece of your life and just take it away from you. 
you're going to have to discover how to get it back. Right? So that's sort of where the prosumer thing comes into play. Prosumer, professional consumer or um, professional having an identity as a, uh, a professional and a consumer is a very interesting one. All right. It's something you really have to take on if you have a significant disorder or a significant um, health issue or a significant issue in your life. Folks, when you are pitted against, you know, you're backed up against the wall, there's really no way to back out of it. What do you do? I call it total recovery. All right. You're going to have to do everything in your life to rise above it. Because if you don't do everything in your life, you're going to get sucked back into it. Folks, you know what it's like, I'm sure, to have a significant issue in your life where you're working at it all the time. As you might imagine, I work at my stuff all the time. But I'm sure there are all sorts of stuff that you folks are dealing with where you're going to work at it all the time. So not only is it a everyday sort of grind where you're constantly learning how to um, recover from these everyday setbacks, but and also do this long-term planning thing, right? That you have to do in life. But you're also discovering that sometimes the system is not really built for you. It's not really built for any of us, is it? But when you have a significant disorder, it's certainly not built for you, all right? Some folks that need, you know, maybe food stamps or I may need you know, medication or certain assistance from time to time. When you have so much stuff going on in your life, that the system is just not prepared and like you're walking in the unknown you're walking in the unknown almost every day you're almost having to guide the system along it okay that's what i do the system really um in terms of especially folks like me all right the, the atypical generation right we had folks right that were so disordered that they lived in institutions the system didn't have to take care of them, right? The society didn't really have to come up with a plan for that. But when people start living in the community and better medications start coming along, right? Where people with severe mental health issues are now living with us and amongst us, and we have to come up with a plan and how that works, right? We call that the atypical generation, better meds, atypical um, you know, antipsychotics or the new meds that allow people to survive out in living in the world that are so disordered and sick. But my point is, when you have so much stuff going on, and you also want to rise above it and not just be part of this learned helplessness, I'm just going to go and, you know, be a sick person and take my meds and live in an adult home. I didn't want that for myself. Who the fuck would, right? Come on, come on. Right? I didn't, I, I, I came from uh, a good background. I went to a great high school. I pushed myself to get into Binghamton once. Um, and, you know, I had good things going for me. I had a supportive family, good friends. I'm an intelligent person. What the hell would I want to live in an adult home for for the rest of my life? Right? Would any of you want that? To live like at like 22, right before you're getting your degree, right? To learn that you, you know, just to get sick and like, conk out and like drop out of life who wants that i didn't want that no and i wasn't gonna have it um i call it like i had a sort of like a flippant name for it in my academic journals that i talked about i call it too big to fail remember obama and the auto industry right when he saved it right it was too big to fail well so am i so am i and you have to think of yourself that way that your life is that important okay that no matter what you do and who you are, that you're too important to let stuff get the better of you and to take you down. All right. So, you know, I think of it as too big to fail. You can come up with your own lingo or verbiage, but the point is, all right, um, I didn't want that to happen for me. So I had to take my intelligence, put it into, put it into practice and say, all right, the system is what they are. Ever, I don't know if any of you folks have ever been hospitalized, um, you know, but the technicians aren't that savvy. They have maybe, you know, a couple, couple of months of training. Therapists aren't that savvy too, all right? Either are doctors, 
all right? You know, ever notice you're smarter than your therapist, right? I know like we're all gonna maybe be a therapist, maybe, all right, I'm a therapist, but they're not that bright, some of them, all right? So like, you have a system of all these people, all right? And I'm like, all right, half of them aren't, you know, all that intelligent, the system sucks, and here I am wanting to rise above it. I have to guide the system. That's why I started to like join these advisory committees. All right. Advisory committees basically sit atop um, different like systems of care and they run stuff by us. Okay. What do you think of this, guys? This is what we're thinking of. And we take our lived experience and say, hey, look, that's, uh, you know, that might not be a good idea once had this issue. You know what I mean? So like, that's that prosumer thing. So like, you're gonna be walking in the unknown, like a lot, if you have a lot going on. It could be diabetes, all right? It could be anything. If you got so much stuff going on, sometimes you're just exploring new options and being creative in how to, in how to problem solve and think of how to get better um, given the limitations of the system and and your history and what you need moving forward. So like, that's a, a bit about why I decided that I was gonna rise above this. So I got back during my healing phase. I said to myself, you know, um, what am I gonna do now? Um, you know, starting to get better, starting to get grounded. So I said to myself, all right, I, I just, I, I I, I'm not going to be a, uh, a uh, I'm not going to ever get admitted to that department because I was still like kind of focused on uh, becoming a, you know, a uh, college rhetoric professor. So I said to myself, all right, just go back to Binghamton, um, recreate it. And that's, that's also a part of that prosumer identity. In terms of your life, if you have that much going on in your life, that's bad you want to start to think about like how to create an identity that's pervasive in all walks of in all areas of your identity so you're not feeling bad all the time you know i felt pretty bad about the fact that i was home and not in grad school um studying so you know um in order to reclaim that that piece of that was lost that identity as a student i put myself in in um community college to get reacclimated in the classroom i knew i wasn't ready to step into graduate school i part of part of knowing yourself and knowing like what what's good for you and what you need and, and what you're capable of and is knowing your limitations you're right your strengths and your weaknesses i knew i wasn't ready I knew I wanted to be uh, in, in school, but I knew I couldn't, you know, deal with that, that level of, of top down, you know, rigorous education. So I sat in a college, a community college, um, you know, class until I was ready to apply to graduate school. Um, and then finally, when my application went back to Binghamton and uh, I believe um, I still remember talking with Brian um, and, you know, he said, you know, said, he said to me, what, you know, how do you know that you're ready for a uh, graduate level education? Uh, and I said, and I said, well, I remember thinking that was so funny that he said that um, thinking, well, thinking I've been gearing up for this for a lot longer um, than, you know, a lot of other folks that like, either go straight from undergrad or take a couple of years off. Just the idea of a graduate level education um, had the significance to me. That was, you know, like, all right, that's kind of funny. Um, if only he knew. Um, and, you know, we continued our conversation and a couple of hours later, I remember getting that acceptance email that I was accepted to the social work department. Um, so, you know, those are the roots of it. That's the roots of my story, basically, before I got to uh, Binghamton and the social work department. It's the etiology, all right? So 
before we get to this, when you have a lot going on and you sort of want to reclaim stuff and go back and figure out like how to you know say here i am again right um because a lot of times we walk out of life we take breaks sometimes whether it's you walk out of the room to take a breath when you're in an argument and go back into the room or you uh <laughs> you have a break in college and need to go back and take a couple years off sometimes a big part of life is saying, here I am again, all right? So when I came back to Binghamton, um, I, you know, I was, it was very clear at that point that I wanted to do mental health and sort of figure out how to professionalize, you know, the idea of me what mental health is, because I knew I would be guiding the system in the future, that my issues would be that significant, that if I didn't specialize in my own disorder, in my own healing, that I wasn't going to make it sort of have to figure out like I remember watching these movies where like um the, like a father has Alzheimer's and the son is trying to figure out a cure before you know the dad forgets everything and you know they will lose touch forever that's sort of like what it was for me except schizophrenia sort of bottoms out and the symptoms are what they are and um you know I had to figure out how to specialize and and be uh professional in 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 my own illness um, that was something that I realized a long time ago. So when I got to Binghamton, I was pretty dead set on mental health and, you know, uh, learning about like how to do this. So like my field placements were mental health, um, and, and all that, but we're going to talk about self-disclosure because remember I went back to school in a place that had treated me. I, and then I would eventually go back home, um, where I was also treated. So like, it's a small world, folks. You're gonna like, if you, you know, you, you're gonna walk alongside your providers, you're gonna talk to them, you'll be a provider at one point or the consumer in another, you know, depending on where you are in the room or what time of day it is, you know, at one point that's your therapist, but at another time, you know, um, it's your colleague, like it's weird. And, it, and these boundaries are even stranger and more complex. So we'll talk about that later on, um, but make a long story short, um, always have a plan B and know that, you know, as bad as it is, it, it'll always get worse. Folks, the day before I started graduate school, I was in a car accident. Um, a lady went through a red light and went and, and, and smashed, um, they needed the draws of life to get me out of the car. Um, I ended up going to my first day of class in graduate school in a wheelchair um, after doing uh, weeks in the hospital uh, from a broken pelvis. My, my father lived with me in the first couple of weeks of graduate school, the first couple of months, because I couldn't toilet myself and care for myself um, physically. So you can imagine, um, you can imagine what it was like learning how to think at, and operate in the world of, con you know, cognitively how to deal with the world. And then now has to deal with it physically. It's like enough's enough, right? But that's life, right? Sometimes stuff piles on and you have to learn like how to filter out everything you can possibly filter out so you can still move forward. It's like pushing the obstacles away and like they're coming down, you're pushing them remember my first supervisor used to go like this. She's filling the gaps in the, in the caseload, you know, um, in the crises, like she's plugging them as, 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 the, as they're erupting. Uh, and sometimes that's what it is. But why, why am I telling you this? Because aside from the fact that, you know, I would, was it once again, put up against this wall of medicalization where I was like, all right, I was sick. Now I'm sick again in a different way. Who am I and what am I? Am I just like this guy who's always sick and dealing with stuff? Yeah, that's how I sort of learned, um, you know, how, how to move forward. It was that there's always going to be stuff and that you have to deal with it as it comes or else it's going to get to the point where it, it's overwhelming. So, yes it can get overwhelming. So how do we not make it overwhelming? 
what is life for me today? Is it overwhelming all the time? Am I getting into car accidents left and right? Um, and like, you know, having breaks every other day and winding up in the hospital. Things are pretty stable. Um, things are pretty stable. I probably wouldn't be able to achieve all those things that John talked about before if, you know, I was in and out of the hospital. I haven't been in the hospital about 10 years. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been pretty stable. But it's been stable because I've learned how, again, to problem solve in almost every avenue of my life. And that's something you'll, you'll figure out how to do, hopefully a little bit with a little help of this presentation. So, um, you know, basically now today I write articles, I have a private practice, I, I work with students, I teach, I do all these great things, but I wouldn't have been able to do all these great things, all right, you know, um, if I didn't learn as a student what the implications were for having a lot of lived experience and how to deal with that, all right? For you folks, it's not about all the great things I've accomplished. It's about how to deal with your stuff, okay? And make it work for you and, and not let it drag you down. So a part of me learning how to do that was knowing that, knowing that like schizophrenia is, um, <clears throat> medication makes you tired. And I had a lot of stuff to do. So I mobilized my parents in the in my care, and a lot of my getting better, and a lot of the folks that like looked at my recovery, like professionals, and said, "How did this guy do what he did?" Um, like Nami, um, they put this quote on their website for a really long time. For my parents, working to support my mental health treatment wasn't a question; it was a priority. All right, my parents were still young ish. They loved me, they cared for me, I had good support. I knew that if I was going to do all the things I wanted to do, I'd basically have to enlist them in my care and, and like for the long haul, all right? Um, and I'm not gonna talk about all the things they've done to help me, but the point is part of knowing how to do what you need to do for yourself is putting the right support around you, right? So, you know, part of, my my journey was putting the right support around me. And a lot of my papers are about collateral support, collateral treatment. A lot of the times when I, I, I when you treat folks, especially young folks, you'll know it's collateral treatment, right? A teenager and young kids, it's about talking to their family, right? Doing therapy with the mom, the dad, all the people around them to make their lives easier, right? Because how much work can you really do with a, four or five, six year old, right? In terms of therapy. The point is, right? Implications. So when I first got back to Binghamton, okay? And I was this college student, I was a social work student now. Um, I also had my stuff and, you know, I was living on my own and I was like, so basically it came, it comes down to this. The big part about being a social work student, right, is your field placement, aside from the academics and being a student in the classroom, all right, and like doing papers and all that like, you know, technical work with language and stuff like that. You have to think about your field placements, right? So like, I did my field placements in first off, medical hospital, and then for an ACT team, a sort of community treatment out of Elmira, um, when evidence-based treatment was on the rise. And, you know, never worked for an ACT team before. Um, thank God I didn't need an ACT team. I had parents to take care of me, right? Um, you know, but like the point is I was on an ACT team. I had I have an active schizophrenia diagnosis, all right? They got a doctor. I'm going the field with nurses, social workers. Assertive community treatment is the highest level of care in the adult mental health system, all right? And here I am, uh, schizophrenic a person with schizophrenia student like out there trying to like complete this social work field placement. So I had to decide very quickly how I would represent myself, who I was gonna be, what I was gonna tell people, all right? I learned a lot of that my first year, honestly, um, in, um, in, the, in a medical hospital. So 
I learned that Well, I learned actually that first year it was a horrible field placement. Um, I remember the um, my my um, field instructor and I just we we sort of like butted heads almost on a on a cultural level, as if I didn't have an, enough stuff going on, um, or you know, in terms of learning, um, like she didn't like my sense of humor um, and she and stuff like that, and like um, you know, it, it just it was a learning experience and knowing. How to represent myself um, without a disorder? I didn't tell her I was sick. She didn't know I was sick, but it was like she just took me and didn't like me for me, and nothing to do with my illness, right? So you know, a lot of times, like we're like, oh, I hate that crazy person. No, you just hate that person, right? It has nothing to do with their diagnosis. It's invisible. They're just assholes. They're not. It's not their symptoms. They're just jerks. So the point is, I learned that, you know, um, you know, I could go into a field placement with this illness and be like, all right, this social work, you know, field person doesn't like me, not for what I came with or my baggage. She just doesn't like the way I do social work. All right. And you know what? I was okay with that. I was a first year student. I wasn't going to be perfect. Right, you're not gonna be perfect when you first sit out, but you will learn, right? Those little learning lessons that, like, how to like, like say, all right, this is how I'm gonna do it better. So, like, after she said, after she wrote my first recommendation or like first evaluation, Max, you're gonna want to look at this strengths to develop further. Uh oh. First, I didn't know what that meant, then I knew what it meant very quickly. Um, and I had a lot of them. I wasn't going to be perfect. I may have been missed their lived experience, but I was not a social worker yet. And I may have had a lot of, um, you know, close, uh, you know, um, run-ins with health and, and, and health disparities, but I didn't know how to treat them. So I learned a lot about what I needed to work on in terms of clinical work um, that first year. But when I got to the ACT team, that's when I first, like, really th thought about self-disclosure, all right? Because, like, it wasn't so much I was in a hospital anymore, all right, um, where, like, you go to a meeting, then you walk around and treat people all day. When you work, on, work for an ACT team or work in mental health, um, you seem to fall into this, like, community of mental health. It's like the mental health community. This, I guess there's a medical community out there, just strictly medical. Um, but I think the language is different. And like I said, um, they sort of just take you for who you are. But when you're in the mental health community, there's this like, you sort of walk into this like invisible layers of stigma and and disclosure and 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 uh, and your history and and who you are and and it's very strange. It's very, very hard to put your finger on it, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a taste of it, all right? So when I first got there, um, you know, I didn't know what it actually really, the model very well. So there's a peer. Anyone know what a peer is, folks? Um, a peer is in the mental health world, someone with lived experience who's basically working as a professional. They've owned their health disorder Okay, and now they're helping people walk alongside them in their recovery. So they're on there, they're on the team to these peers. And you also have the social workers, the psychiatrists. So I remember back then, all right, back then, um, you know, the social worker was always talking about Joe, Joe. Where's Joe? He's out again today. Oh, Joe didn't make it. He's he never takes enough clients. He's always coming up short. Joe is the peer. All right. Now, I noticed that this, the doctor didn't get attacked a lot. The doctor really wasn't evaluated for his behavior a lot, even though he yelled, he shouted, he was uncouth. Was he ever talked about as sick though? Was he ever disordered? No, he was a psychiatrist. God forbid we say he's, he's got a disorder back then, all right? My point is, 
it always seemed to be the peer, all right? It always seemed to be the person who disclosed their lived experience that when they were out a day, or they didn't sleep well the night before, or they were talking about some aspect of their social life that was maybe a little shady, that that was because they had a mental health disorder or that, that they were sick in the past, all right? You get where I'm going with this? My point is, very early on, I saw and I observed that the peer or the person that disclosed their mental health stuff in the mental health community was vulnerable, was at risk, okay, of being labeled and saying they're not well enough to do their work. Um, in fact, one of my most recent articles, it came out a couple of days ago, Man, of, in, Man, of, Man in America is on the um, peers and this, what I'm talking about here, how there's always this like undercurrent of blame and shame that they're not well enough to do their job, some conversation about their health. Um, I have in the end, you'll see it in the uh, work cited if you wanna retrieve the article. The point is early on, I knew that I better be damn careful about who I say and my history on this team. I walked in there I always have a walk about me, people say it. But um, I didn't say a darn thing about my mental health history. In fact, it wasn't until I was getting signed off on, on like my clinical like packet by, you know, the old, my old supervisor. They said, yeah, I had a lot of mental health stuff. Said, I didn't know that. I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna tell you. Folks, be careful. I'm not telling you to be scared, but um, and I'm certainly not telling you to hide anything. But when you're in the professional world, unless you're working as a peer and you want to step into that world where like you're constantly, um, you know, up against this, like, are you still sick? Are you okay? Um, as a social worker, you know, you want to be careful about what you disclose and what you don't disclose. You know, it's not just about like, it's also about like your clients and how much is it benefiting them in terms of what you disclose, right? But like, it's also about like, why you're talking about it. And if you are talking about it, remember, there is a, just like there's a paper trail and a, and like they call it, what do they call it? Like a carbon footprint or, a, you know, of, of like what you do out there, even with technology, this is a verbal footprint and people remember things. And they put things together um, that may not correlate and will and will start pointing their finger. You bet they will. Um, the point is, um, back then I learned very on that it was important to really figure out what I wanted and who I wanted to say things to. Um, and you want to insulate yourself, okay? You want to make sure that when you're out there working, that you have a certain group of friends around you, work colleagues, right? Circles, circles of insulation, circles of support, um, circles of, of insulation where if negative stuff erupts, it has to pass through these circles first before it can get to other folks that can say, hey, what's going on there? All right. So the point is, you know, um, you can't, you can't like guard yourself and be on guard forever. You can't hide everything about you. Um, but, and you also have to realize that stuff is just going to inherently go wrong. Even if you like, even if you do everything you can, you know, stuff's going to go wrong anyway. So it's about planning for that too. So I would like at this point, given that like, I've told a lot of stories to to ask if there are any questions about what I've covered so far. Can we do that? Is that possible? It's good by me. Oh, I guess if I have to pass through you, no, I, does that work? Can we talk a little bit? How about a conversation? How can we facilitate that job? Uh, you know, this is a very uh, talkative group of folks, and I don't think that you're going to have any issue, especially now that I've said that, um, with this with this group asking you questions about your lived experience, about navigating your dual, you know, role as both a right. 
consumer of services and a professional provider of services. Right. Um, I think, and, and also what we've heard is that folks are very interested in hearing about what it's like to be on the other side as a clinician. Right. And I'm, I'm really, that's what I'm hoping for, that we have a lively conversation about that, uh, all of that. Because it's, I can only say so much about my history and, and the, the points of conflict that I've passed through. But you folks have, uh, I'm sure, a rich history of your own lives and your own conflicts that you passed through and had to resolve. So if I could be of any service in terms of guiding you further or talking about what my history can speak to, I'm happy to do that. So let's open the floor. Questions? q and time, let's start. Um, um, I have a question. Uh, so first, uh, thank you for sharing uh, your story. That's so compelling and it really speaks to my own experience. Um, how do you, like I hear your caution about disclosure and of course, considering the client and stuff, but I feel like I've heard a lot that um, disclosure of one's own struggle can help destigmatize uh, mental illness and mental health struggles. Um, how do you balance that against protection of yourself? Do you have thoughts or insights on that? Sure. So I have a blog, right? Um, one of the first things I started doing was writing. And that was part of my healing experience, was writing about my stuff. And um, I was mental health, health affairs that blog, if you folks ever want to check it out. But you're all on computers now, you can't even do that. But the point is, I started blogging about all my different experiences. It became therapeutic in the sense that it allowed me to write a book and do all these things. And it put stuff out there. A lot, also a lot of my journal articles talk about um, my history and my struggle. I take a prosumer approach to a lot of the journals, journaling that I do. I talk about my symptoms and how treatment would work given my experience with them. So you're right, it does destigmatize um, um, in terms of being very candid and open about your experiences. However, however, when you're doing one-on-one -on -one work like therapy in terms of um, therapy in terms of like working one-on-one -on -one or working with a family, um, in terms of your setting, in terms of your role, it may not be the best thing to always go to first. So like you could, you know, obviously, oh yeah, I have a family too. Or um, sure, I've had my struggles with anxiety, but to be like really detailed and, and, and specific about all the stuff that like you went through in terms of the therapeutic process, then I would say it's not just not appropriate. It's also, um, it, it, it's, it may not serve to drive treatment forward because like when you're practicing clinically, you're, you're looking how to, how to move people um, in a certain direction in towards treatment goals. And when you're talking about your own stuff, um, unless they have, they're hung up on issues of stigma, um, which they probably more, interested in their own lives and how to feel better and get better, um, it may not be the best route to go to first in terms of clinical treatment. Um, but if you're a peer and like you're in the peer world where you're talking about your stuff and walking that journey of recovery through the system, then it might be more appropriate. So I guess in terms of role and um, what you're setting out to achieve by telling your story, then I, I guess I would look to that first. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I meant uh, with colleagues, um, uh, but that, that makes sense. Sure. Well, with colleagues, that's, that's, uh, that's another, that's, a, that's, that's what Brian and Mary C used the uh, term sticky wicket. Does he still do that um, with you folks? Anyway, um, so like, it's a sticky wicket. It's a very complicated thing. So like, when I first started to practice as a therapist, um, you know, I'm not, I know other people have stuff too they may not see a therapist, or maybe they do. Um, so like, you're gonna meet a lot of people that like choose like it, it, as professionals not to disclose. I've worked with a lot of other therapists that clearly have stuff and we'll talk about their stuff in social engagements, but not be late. They don't wanna label themselves as peers or as people with a diagnosis. Um, so like, it's strange. 
therapist in terms of like taking on a diagnosis is a very taboo thing. Um, because like, how do you, it's like people, people think that if you take on this like disordered part of your identity, you're not able to teach people how to think around it and above it and, and to live in spite of it. Um, you know, they, they, uh, they will say that every part of you, um, you know, becomes attached to that diagnosis and that you're too disordered to carry out your work. But like, in terms of like in the workforce and with colleagues, I would just, I would just be, um, I would just be mindful of not, not, not talking about so much, like you want to think about what are you achieving by every conversation. So like, are you going to talk about like how you got sick and threw up and like all the details about it? Or are you going to use it as a learning moment? So I guess if it's the lived experience is mobilized in a learning moment and not so much as like status, this is how things are, um, it's, it's going to be a, a lot of reframing and and um, redirecting of the conversation. Uh, it's labor intensive. See how I'm talking like this? I almost feel like I'm inundated just by the very thought of what what to do and what not to do. You're caught in this liminal space where you're up against the unknown and it's like, you may, you, someone may respond the right way or they may not. Um, there are people there that still believe that people are, have that, are have certain diagnoses are are really not good people that they're that that because they have a certain mental health disorder that they can't carry out their work. So really, it's almost like a crapshoot too. Like you could plan for it. You could say like, well, if I teach it in a certain way that makes sense, hopefully they'll think it makes sense. But in the end, it may not because they might be just jerks and think that people with mental health stuff aren't good people. So like. You don't know almost until like you know the person that you're disclosing to. So that's what I would say. Get to know who you're speaking to and what they think about uh, mental health stuff before you disclose. That may that may be um, a smart thing to do. Yeah. Does that make sense too? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so what I'm getting from what you're saying is maybe if you want to present like some of the challenges you faced, maybe the best way to present it as something that you um, worked through and overcame rather than really getting into like maybe what you're suffering from at the moment in terms of what you want to disclose to maybe colleagues or um, or even clients, like if you want to disclose something personal, it probably should have a message of like, this is something that was really hard for me. And I learned um, ways to cope and instead of just uh, maybe disclosing that you are in it at the, at the at this moment, would you say that's true? Yeah, or? That's, yeah, I would say that's true. If you're still, if you're disclosing that, like you're still struggling with something that's fairly significant that may impact your work in a certain way or maybe damaging your walk you're walking into a very a very you're walking into the danger zone if you will in terms of like self-disclosure in the clinical world um so like if there's no message and you didn't, and you didn't learn how to work through it um uh, people are going to question you know they're going to they're start questioning and those questions are going to move in the right direction so yeah, that's, I would say exactly that. And, and I don't wanna make folks think that like, you can't rise above the danger zone and find like creative ways of making it work. And, and, and like, I've done that. Like a lot of these like ideas of, of the self-disclosure, I've written articles about, and you will too, you know, about how to rise above it and make people question the status quo. You know what I mean? It's like working in the system despite the system. But how much can you do that before, you know, you 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 implode? 
right? So it's like, how much can you take on before, you know, like it's too much? So like, there's a pendulum there. And I, I, want, I want you folks to understand that. You know, I'm not saying don't, don't question and don't, don't make people like think twice about things for learning moments, but know that if you take too much on, right? It's that self-care piece. If you do so much to prove a point that you get sick again, you're not proving a point. Right? Hi, um, thank you so much for uh, your story. I found it really inspiring um, that you decided to kind of make it your narrative rather than kind of just go with what, you know, what could happen if you just kind of went the way. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering like, if you feel like now uh, your diagnosis of schizophrenia, is that any source of strength for you? Like, do you, do you feel like it's a, a tool or has any value? Sure. Um, you know, in terms of, well, yeah, sure. Again, I guess it speaks to that like pendulum, right? So like, I know that I need to think really closely and monitor myself very closely. Like I look at my weaknesses. Um, like I know that since my diagnosis, hygiene, right? Like you folks can't smell me now, thank God. And I, and I do smell great. But like, I know I need to like be really careful about that because I know that that can take a dip in certain other areas of my life um you know like in terms of like if i get really um close to like my injection time i can experience loosening of associations so like i know i need to be careful with my language um and 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 i know that if i'm like how to look at what i'm saying and really think very closely about it so i guess i would say it's made me more mindful. It's made me more mindful, definitely. Um, and it's definitely gave me another look at another side of the population and how they live their lives um, and how to be creative with problem solving because I certainly solve more problems than the everyday person given the, the cards that was dealt. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, so it sounds like you know how to be proactive. So you have all these like skills that you've gained from your experience and things that you can offer maybe as help. Absolutely. Um, and that's why when I'm when I practice, I really like practicing with folks with more uh, significant impairments. And I've always gravitated towards like act teams um, on track. Um, programs that target people that are more disordered, um, you know, for a lot of reasons. One, because I, I do know about it and carry a lot of those skills that I've used in my own life to get better. Uh, but also that I don't necessarily see a lot of these folks as hopeless, and a lot of people do. New York State Mental Health System says hope and recovery. It's their mantra, hope and recovery. A lot of these clinicians really don't have hope for the people that are very sick. All right, they really don't. Um, and you're gonna have to go out there and change that. And, and a part of that's gonna be mobilizing your own lived experience. Say, hey, look, someone like me can get better. Look at me, I'm living proof of it, all right? And I'm gonna take the skills I've learned and hand it to this person so they can do it too. Um, and I think that's gonna be critical for a lot of for the recovery movement moving forward, that you folks go out there and do that. I do. Yes, I do. I, I wondered if you could talk more about, I really loved what you were talking about when you were saying that phrase like too, too big to fail. Um, I thought that was awesome. And like that whole piece of like your identity building, like um, that was, 
resonated with me like so much and I was so interested in that because like I sort of I had a similar identity thing where um in my younger years I was a I was a professional dancer and I like toured all over the world and I was like a full-time performer um and then I got like a major injury and um I was in pain like 24 7 um and I had to like retire and um and so it was like a huge like like tremendous mental shift like to deal with like chronic pain and like completely like redo my identity and like for a while I just like totally gave up I just went on pain medication I stopped trying I felt like completely incapacitated um and I had to do like really slow things to build myself back up for a while I was just like paralyzed by like pain and fear and I couldn't do anything and then um I just started to do these little things like I um found chair yoga was something that I could do um that was like the only thing that didn't cause me pain and so I started doing that and now I teach that um and I just started to do like little things to get make, make me feel like um like rebuild my sense of control again and um so I, I don't know you're I, I was just really resonating with what you're talking about and I guess so did you like at that attitude of like too big to fail did you always have that or was that something that you built over time oh you know it's somebody because like it helped me right with my recovery but it definitely um it's 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 roots came from my disorder um because you know when i was you know like applying to graduate school doing all these things fight against the university um there was a certain haughtiness and a certain arrogance and a certain like I can face this huge institution, me, Max Gutman, and fight against it, overturn this admission decision and alter language and do all these things because I'm that great. You know what I mean? And like, so like, I think I, you know, and a part of that's youth, right? I was young, you know, I was coming out of my adolescence, young adulthood. Part of that, you know, is like, you know, you know, also like, Again, when you're pitted against pushed against the wall, you got to do what you got to do. But it definitely, uh, ironically, came um, out of my disorder, where like, you know, I'm just doing everything I could and feasibly in the imaginary world and in the world of reality um, to make it, to impose my will on reality and make something possible that was impossible. Um, so. You know, I I, gen I see a lot of what I have to go through and sometimes I'm almost like, oh my God, I won't do it anymore. I can't stay anywhere. I would love, you know, like, like, but like, you know, like it's that like too big to fail. I've just got so much either going for me in terms of support, my own knowledge of how the world works and how I operate within it and knowing that I can pull from these resources at any given time, um, to get what I need to move forward. Um, so like, it definitely has this dual relationship where it came from the disorder, but it was put into practice in my recovery. I would like, um, I'm wondering if um, we could, I'd like to almost pull up a quote, um, a, a paper that I would like to share with you. It's uh, that like talks about this. Is there a way, John, to, uh, how do I do that? Uh, if you, uh, you can probably just drop it in the chat and then the file should be shared with everybody. So just right. uh, yeah. if you have a, like a PDF, you can just drag it into yeah. the chat. Uh, chat. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. Um, let me stop the share for a minute. Whoa. All right. <laughs> Research. Ah, all right. So actually, the best way of doing this is yeah. You know, um, it's a part of life. You have to serve the level of narcissism. Is a narcissist it's loving yourself, right? Um, and believing in your future. All right. So then, we'll try to speak to this. And, uh, you know, Max, we can take a, a 10, 15 minute break. If oh, I, now seems to be good. Maybe yes. biologically, people might want to um, handle sure. their needs. Sure, yeah. I know. I certainly need a voice in my lips. But here is, uh, this is the article. So I'm just going to pull up 
the one um, sort of it's called the role of the support system in improving mental health prognosis. So you folks know, um, you know, it, it runs through this idea, you know, it's radical, a, lo a lot of the stuff we're talking about. But I do remember there being a, a whole thing about too big to fail here. So what we'll do is I think that's a good idea. We'll take a break, I'll pull up the quote and um, have a few sips of water. How does that sound everybody? Thumbs up. I'm good. good. Awesome, awesome. It's been a pleasure so far. It'll be a pleasure again on the flip side. See you. So we'll be back at about uh, how's 240 sound. Take 15 minutes to stretch and, and get your eyes away from Zoom and we'll see you back uh, at, at that time. How are we doing, everybody? All right, so. All right. Let's try this shit. So a lot of what we talked about so far has been the theoretical roadmap of, you know, my story, how I've gotten to where I've gotten, my general stance. But a lot of what we haven't talked about really, or what we sort of, uh, began to tease out is the, the more difficult, how do you do it, right? How do you do this, right? It's one thing to have a stance and belief, right? It's another thing to actually put it into practice and make it happen. So um, like I said from the very beginning, <laughs> sometimes when you have so much going on and there's no answers yet, you're sort of walking in the unknown. That's why we have clinical trials, right, folks? Research, hospitals, right? You know, sometimes, right, you have advanced cancers and they're in all sorts of strange areas. Doctors don't know what to do, right? Psychiatry is really no different. And the mental health system and treatment, you know, is really no different. You know, we're still figuring out how to make things happen for people with certain disorders and for folks experiencing certain symptoms. Either there's just so much going on or there's certain other factors in their life like they've got no support or um, they've got medical comorbidities or they're in this strange um, uh, precarious poverty level where they need system support, but they need specialized care. You know, like it comes down to this. You're gonna be walking in the unknown. And if you're bright, and you want to have a better life and rise above what the state provides you, right? Um, in terms of like what, what to give it out, you have to learn how to, to, to take that and to take what you have here and your knowledge and your experience and make it work for you in a better way. So like what I did was, and what my belief has been thus far, and it's been working for me is I do my own research, right? Um, I do, I write, you know, these journal articles and, you know, um, and and start off with blogging actually to, to get right down to it. Um, you know, I, when I first got back from the hospital, I was writing, right? And, um, you know, I started writing a lot because I had a lot of healing to do. So like I was writing, 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 and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. I was writing all these posts on Facebook, okay? And talking about like my lived experience and my health and like people are like Max, why are you talking about this on Facebook? And I'm like, I don't know. Where else am I gonna put it? I didn't know what to do. I had no experience with this. So someone suggested, you know, blog, write, uh, put it in a journal, you know. And what I started doing was I set up a WordPress account and I just started to write post after post about uh, different aspects of my healing experience, okay? And what I needed to do to either get better, it started off as 
as self-management. And a lot of clinicians out there will say, oh, can we ever rise above self-management in terms of mental health? No, a lot of, for some folks, it's very important, all right? Um, you know, a lot of people like to be very um, uppity sometimes when it comes to mental health and like what we talk about with people. But sometimes people need the basics, all right? Sometimes they need the basics. When you're shitting yourself because you can't get up, you need the basics. You don't need uh, a specialized, you know, um, you know, technical language and way of thinking about things. No, you need to know how to get up and go to the bathroom, right? Um, so that's just where it comes down to it. Um, so like I start off in my blogging, I was talking about, you know, self-management in terms of my illness and basically um, what I did to think through certain problems um, that were, you know, either hoisted at me or were internal. And I started writing and blogging and eventually, you know, got lengthy. And I started to put together some papers. And, um, you know, those papers were actually, um, you know, picked up on by this folk, folks over in Europe um, who um, have had a similar stance and belief in blogging and, and, and writing and getting the most current information out there as fast as possible and around the world circulated because that's the way to do it. Um, if you have a lot going on, want to get better faster, force feed it, speed it along, do what you need to do to get better fast, right? And, and do it quickly because, you know, you only have one life, right? I don't want to get better at age 60. I want to get better now. So what I did was, you know, I just put all my energy in terms of blogging and writing and putting together these papers. And my first paper to get published um, was a, a paper on my injections, intramuscular injection. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks, I had this different stance, all right? So like a lot of folks out there, you know, that um, are in the mental health world, they think injections aren't compliant. He's not compliant injection, right? Because we give injections to people a lot of the time that either are non-compliant with their medication, they don't want to take their meds, they throw their pills out, that they can't be trusted to, to take their meds on their own. So we give them injections because it's in their system and that's all there is to it, all right? I had a different belief. I want an injection, not because I'm non-compliant, but because I'm so adherent that I don't want to ever um, know that I missed a dose, all right? I want to take the element of compliance and adherence out of the conversation and out of the therapeutic clinical piece. I knew from being a therapist and knowing that when I work with people and having that piece in me, it's like, is he taking his meds? Is he not? Should we have a conversation about meds? No, take that conversation out of the clinical picture and just focus on the therapy and not these questions and uncertainty on whether or not this person is sticking and adhering to their treatment. In my opinion, in the argument I made that injections aren't just for punishment, they open up a wide range of clinical opportunities for treatment, okay? A wide range. So, you know, there's people who read it like, oh, this is a new stance. Oh, he's blogging and you know like what is he doing here so like um a lot of what my writing has gone in the direction of europe and and that journal because you know um you know we, you know journals carry you know certain camps in in the academic world sort of um find find um piece together and you know believe that what they're doing is the right way but um you know i found i found a lot of the camps that at least I gravitated initially, we're welcoming to this prosumer approach and this open um, thinking around uh, adherence, compliance, and what to do if you're sick and disordered to get better and, and, and reclaim a sense of yourself. So a lot of journals out there aren't, um, and just so you know, and folks in terms of writing um, and, and publishing. You know, you'll find a lot of these niches where like they're only looking for one thing. You can't talk about your lived experience, but if you're, but if you have lived experience, you can't be a clinician or vice versa. It's nonsense. You want to find um, writing and outlets so you know 
um, that are open to not only a belief that you know that works, right? But you know, you just want to publish in a way that makes sense for the world and, and growth of the discourse, right? Stay out of these camps because, like, these camps are, are so almost similar to the camps in your life. These little thickets that we get stuck in and we can't think outside of. Keep it open. Um, but anyway, the point is that um, you know a lot of my writing went that way, and I ended up going and doing this talk on logging as a intervention to basically like talking about yourself and writing about yourself as a therapeutic intervention for not only the self um but it, you know evaluating like you know where you're at and and what you need for yourself so there was a question before about you know what to share what not to share in terms of writing disclosure you know i put everything out there if you look at my blog um you know it's all about it is all about self-disclosure and 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 what I've done to get better in a self-management way and to heal, but also to teach others how to do it. But my point is when doing this, right? When thinking about like blogging and writing, I did it to get better. I didn't do it, you know, I did it <clears throat> because I had to figure out a way forward. There was no way forward. Um, People like me, uh, the atypical generation that I talked about, just don't, didn't exist for the most part. Um, I hear all the time from colleagues, Max, you're an enigma. Max, you're, Max, you're this, Max, you're that. It's just that I come in this historical space where I wasn't chained to a bed and, you know, one flew in the cuckoo's nest. But at the same time, you know, um, you know at the same time, I, I, I still was caught up in some issues of stigma that need to get resolved. Things are better, they're not where they need to be. Uh, and they're certainly not where they need to be for me, but maybe I've learned enough about history and my own experience to put other people and other players in a place where they need to be. Uh, so folks like me can heal further, if that makes any sense. So blogging I thought was a way to do it for a lot of reasons, all right? Even self-diagnostic reasons. So like, Ever like, ever post and like look at someone's post, a friend of yours on Facebook, you're like, well, they posted like 3 a.m. You know what I mean? What are they doing? You know what I mean? So like, it, it's no different really with blogging and and um, and and looking sort of that self-monitoring piece that we talked about before. How do I like, what are my strengths now that I have schizophrenia? I really look at myself closely. So like I look at timestamps closely on my stamps are, are my posts a, a lot coming out at once. Do they seem manic? Um, now are, is the writing clear um, all the time? Or, you know, is that fifth post, that last post just off the wall and not making any sense at all because I've strung out and I posted it at 5 a.m. Um, and it's timestamped that way. Um, but also because when you share, right? We live in a world of sharing and communication. It's an interdependent world. And with someone with schizophrenia and my own stuff who gets locked away in his own mind, blogging helps me get out there and expose myself to a, a, a bigger world. I'm no longer isolated, that like sick person isolated in his house. I'm sharing my thoughts with everybody all the time. That's something I, 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 I thought was a benefit from blogging in terms of what I needed to do to heal. So for example, for example, when you share, right? I, I, I looked at it, I did this in the presentation. I put a, like when you share, like for example, a post like messenger or something, and like a friend either doesn't respond or they're like, what? Or like, why are you doing this? I, I What I did was I cut that out. I took a screenshot and I circled it. And I, I, I said, that's collateral reception of my behavior, right? What are people thinking of my writing and what are they thinking about of what I'm setting and putting out there? Are they liking it? Are they not liking it? Is that a friend? Are they being supportive? Are they reading it? Are they not reading it? What's their input? So like, it's all these tools. Blogging is just one example, all right? It's what do you need to do in your life 
right? What tools do you need to harness, right? To get out there and achieve what's unachievable right now, given the structural limitations of your environment or your life or, or technology or medicine, right? Um, so like, what are you gonna do to alter that and move forward? I stumbled upon blogging, um, you know, and, and, and just because that, you know, flippant remark about why I was posting a lot on Facebook, all that stuff. Someone told me there was a better medium. And it turned out that medium could be used in various ways for my recovery. But what mediums are you gonna use, you know? Maybe they don't exist yet. Or maybe, maybe you'll need to create them or, or think about things in a way that makes more sense for your healing. So, so yeah, um, you know, in terms of self-disclosure, it's not so much colleagues that you talk to, you know, um, because like, sure, you're gonna talk to colleagues about your stuff, your day to day. Hopefully you won't frame it in terms of diagnosis because that's not even useful any of the time. It's you wanna frame it, frame it in terms of what you're dealing with and struggling with and, and, and what you learn from it. But the point is, there's a bigger world out there, right? You'll find that the problem usually isn't the people around you so much, like your friend or your this or that, it's the larger systems, right? So you want to figure out how to influence these larger systems out there um, and, and, and do it in a way that allows you to live your life in, in a better way. So like, for example, for example, um, and, and, and all this plays into the identity too. So like, I had an issue with the state hospital, okay? I didn't like the fact that I got sent to the state hospital from the community hospital. Not that I was doing really well and big into general, I really wasn't. Um, and I really did need a higher level of care, but I didn't exactly like the way the psychiatrist went about it, all right? Um, she said the very last thing I remember hearing from the doctor in, in the quiet room, right? Before I got sent to the state hospital was, you're not gonna like where you're going. And I'm like, what? And I didn't know what was going on. You know, I'm just this guy in the hospital. I'm just like sick. I'm like really out of it. And all I remember her saying was, you're not gonna like where you're going. So a part of me reclaiming my identity, right? As a prosumer and a part of me talking about the state hospital system and altering that, right? And for other folks and for navigating that part of my history and, and knowing that this needs to change for other people, like I said, was in my research and in my writing. So one of the first things I did um, was in my writing, it was the one of the, was, you know, a paper on the state hospital system. So, you know, and how to dismantle higher levels of care that really are, that really don't make sense anymore. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I wanted to leave this is it right here. Nope. I wanted to talk about that. I want to show you exactly how I reclaim that for myself. So many articles, so much reclaiming. Like I said, if you have a lot to reclaim, you're not going to stop doing it. Uh, it's, 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 uh, becomes a way of life. Um, but here we, oh, see, there's that injection piece. Let's see. Oh, I may have to look it up. <sighs> All right, let's, let's pull it up. Because it's that important. All right, so. How did I reclaim this? Can you folks see my screen? John? Not yet. Not yet. All right, good. Good. All right. Now let's let's uh let's share it. There we go. So a part of me reclaiming this that like 
that peace and belief of like how the system works and my history and my experience there was to write a paper about it. Let's see if this is the right one. Nope, nope. Let's see, can you, what can, what can you see, John? Nothing? The role of support system uh -huh. in improving mental health prognosis. Wrong one. I want to show this one. How about this? Do you see the discontinuation? Uh, it's a little bit blurry, but I can make it. Yep, yep, that's good. All right. So part of being a clinician, right, and a uh, consumer, you know, with the experience is you want to change the system and make it better for other folks. And also, if you get sick again, right, um, you will. I will. Um, want to be better when I go back in. So, like, you think about the system and you think about the system for people. And for me, uh, part of the system was like this, was stuck on the state piece, right? Still bent on why I got set there. So I believe that we need state hospitals. A lot of folks will say, get rid of the hospitals, especially the state hospitals. But the thing is folks, in just my own opinion, all right? Um, not only do we need hospitals, right? Because we always need spaces, right? We need spaces for people and levels of care um, that, you know, if, if you don't do well in one space, you should have another space. But how many spaces are there going to be before that gets redundant? And if you're moving from space to space, when are you getting better? Like if you keep failing out, failing out, when are you recovering? So like, I had this belief when I was in the hospital, right? I, I heard the talking, I was in the admissions unit for six months, okay? That's like the entry unit, the point of entry into the state hospital where like, if you fail out of there, you get sent to the back of the hospital, right? Uh, where it's extended care. Now, you'll, you'll see this in the state hospitals, you'll also see it in day treatment continuing day, extended treatment. When does it stop? When do you get better? Continuing day, when does it end? Right? What are we doing with these people? Right? What are we doing? Like if we're not treating them, if they're not experiencing relief, if they're not getting better, then why are they there and why are they in it? And why aren't we figuring out a way to make it work for them? So like, I just hang up on state hospitals and the extended care units, right? Extended care and like long-term care. I think we need state hospitals. We always need spaces. But when it comes to like continuing and deferment of, of getting better and experiencing relief, that's, that's a problem. Continuing extended care, why are we extending it? Why aren't we talking about the recovery of them getting better, right? Why are we talking about extending their care? And if they're not getting better, what's wrong with the treatment, right? So the other piece of this was to stick it right back to that psychiatrist. So right at the beginning of this paper was, I'll never forget the words of my psychiatrist in the community hospital in which I was receiving treatment for first episode psychosis. You're not gonna like where you're going. Capture language, folks. Like I said, I was an English major. I love language, right? I love, and I always said, you know, I'd be like an English professor, rhetoric, whatever. I learned how to mobilize language in a very specific and concrete way in not only my recovery, um, but um, in, in clinical work and speaking with people and aligning with clients, but also, you know, as a, as a defense mechanism not letting people talk above me um, because like when you're sick, people will talk above you. You know, there are good workers, but there are also people that trigger you and will speak in various ways that um, are condescending. And I learned how to utilize language in a way and understand language in a way where no one really got to speak above me. And that was a way for me not only to be um, more grounded in my care, but it also made 
I also learned that, you know, folks like this doctor who pushed me out of this level of care, um, and I didn't know how to respond to that, you know, was to really look and evaluate these statements and say what's happening here and make sure that these statements are never mo mo mobilized again, either in my work or in, or in the work of other folks and other practitioners doing the wrong thing. You know, you have to look at statements and meaning and why people say the things they do and know how to respond to them in meaningful ways and in ways that push back against, um, you know, discrimination and injustice and, and all sorts of nefarious things going on in the mental health world. Um, so I captured that language. I capture a lot of language. Um, you know, I, I may have you know, all these things going on for me, but I'm still a prosumer, right? I work with various systems, they work for me. I have housing, I live in subsidized housing. This apartment here um, is um, uh, a part of a, a housing program. It's subsidized and I go through a housing agency. I have a housing case manager I work with. Um, all sorts of folks in the mental health system. But, you know, um, my point is that when you work with all these different people who could have all these either different motives or intentions, right? You're not just surrounded by your family and friends anymore. You're surrounded by five or six workers because you're very sick that could have punt your case in the wrong direction or move it, um, you know, in terms of like dropping your uh, benefit or whatever. You need to know how to take their language and say, hey, what are you saying there? I'm gonna lose my benefits if that happens let's not do that let's do this right you need to know what words mean and and what the implications are for certain statements um that was a bold statement that doctor made um you and um i after looking at it and thinking about it you know um i learned and thought about this right um like i was pending immediate transfer for unresolved psychosis right for ongoing care well when is the care going to stop i don't want to live in a hospital forever unresolved let's resolve it why aren't we resolving it like like what's going on here where it can't be resolved where either i'm not getting the right medication or what i need um at this level of care to make it treatment work for me right why do i need to go to the state hospital to resolve my psychosis why can't we resolve it right here right so a part of the prosumer journey and being an expert in your own stuff is knowing a lot about your stuff, right? It, 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 academically, um, socially, right? We talked about like, what do you share with people? Um, I learned um, very early on in the workforce, you know, um, you know, to be, to compartmentalize my stuff. I learned not to be a peer and a clinician in the same agency. I wrote about um, that in a couple articles. You can't be both. It's that dual role thing that doesn't work. You can't like, um, and it's a lot of stuff. But the point is people, once they see you one way, and it's, um, people have a strange sort of, let's just say, <sighs> so I guess I have to tell the whole story. All right, so when I first landed in the workforce, um, you know, after I got back and got my license, I started off as a clinician, right? I didn't want to be that peer in the ACT team when I was, you know, a student. I, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to talk about my lived experience. I'm going to be that clinician. I'm going to go out there and do my thing. But, you know, life erodes on you. And um, what I mean by life is, like, your life and, like, who you are, and you sort of want to be who you are. You know, um, you can't really go through life hiding without losing a piece of yourself. And you can't, you can't be authentic and be a, a clinician, um, you know, a good one at least, if you're not authentic and not being yourself. And you can't teach people how to be themselves if you aren't who you are and aren't real about that. I, at least that's my belief. Um, so after a while, I said to myself, I'm gonna do some peer work. I need some extra money. I just said, I'll do some stuff on the weekend. Right? So the agency is what it is. Again, we have to sort of think above these systems of care. Like, 
you're going to work with this client and you're going to also be his peer and his clinician. I'm like, but that doesn't work. You can't burn the stick at two ends. You can't, you know, the person just isn't going to understand that. It's not going to work out for the team. Making a long story short, um, it didn't work out well. Um, so I was sort of blamed for it. Things happen the way they do. Um, but make, make a, uh, you know, make a long story short. Um, I still believe that when you have lived experience, you know, it's a clinician can make a mistake and it's a mistake and that's all there is to it. They need maybe a corrective action plan is done. Maybe they need to do a little reflecting if it's like a really like, you know, intense supervisor. But when a um, peer makes a mistake because of his lived experience, it is they, it, you know, it's sort of put there um, that they're making mistakes because they're sick. Things need to be evaluated. I was went from being a clinician um, in my first job at, at a good standing. And then when I became a peer um, and um, things didn't go well, I was reduced to answering phones. Phones. Um, I sat there with the program secretary who didn't really like me very much. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I was answering phones all day and people were like, are you going to go out and see people? I'm like, they won't let me see people there, you know, because, you know, uh, they think I'm, you know, they thought I was getting sick again. I wasn't getting sick. Um, it's just that either there was a, a difference or a, you know, um, a discrepancy in terms of like, what the right clinical pathway forward was. I thought one way, they thought another. And sometimes there are multiple ways forward. Um, but either way, there was a fallout. And you better believe a clinician is not going to be reduced to answering phones in a lot of agencies, but a peer would. Um, and I, I, I really believe that. I believe that because in another job that I held, um, after my, uh, you know, I was friendly with my the director, she left. And someone I wasn't friendly with got the job. Um, and uh, there was this like, you know, who's going to get the director job near this person when they got the job. Um, a couple weeks later, I, uh, I was told that I'm not doing my job well. That, um, that I, uh, I, I may be getting sick again that I need to have less responsibilities. It was almost the same thing happening again and again and again. <coughs> that if you're sick or have a history of, of mental health stuff, you know, maybe you need to have less stuff going on, less responsibilities. It, it felt like it was the same thing. Um, in fact, I, I got rid of an email that said, you know, Max is sick. And I went to my other boss that had left. I said, why is she doing this? She knows I have lived experience. Is she doing this to be like, she was my supposedly like a colleague. Now this one, I'm sick. It was the most humiliating thing in the world. But I left that job um, and I said to myself, never again um, will I disclose my lived experience if I'm working as a clinician. I'll be a peer as a peer, be a clinician as a clinician, um, but know that um, in this day and age until the sociological um, aspects of self-disclosure change and stigma um, takes a certain, um, evaporates in certain realms of, of are the day-to-day. -day. Sometimes you, you need to compartmentalize pieces of your identity and know that, you know, you, this is who you are today and, and, and this is what you're here for and that's all there is to it. Like, it, it's very sad. Like, I, I left two jobs, two jobs, um, because they said I was getting sick again. Two jobs. And these were clinicians that said I was getting sick. And, and uh, supposedly, you know, friends, uh, friends, right, work friends. So like, you know, it's, it's sad, but it's a fact of life. People will mobilize what they can um, to sort of position themselves for whatever reasons, whether it's ladder climbing or, um, 
or whatever. They'll do what they need to do, and you know, they'll 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 latch on to these discriminatory um, possibilities, if you will. Or like if they talk about this thing that evokes a certain taboo um, thing that isn't talked about, you could walk away from a job um, without an explanation. Uh, so like, be careful. Just be careful. Uh, if you do, I my recommendation to you all is still, if you do peer work, um, you know. Um, don't 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 feel like um, you can hold multiple hats in the mental health world um, without worlds colliding. Even in academic journals, even in forums on the internet, you're a social worker and a peer. You have lived experience and you treat people. No, folks, you can have a thousand hats, but for some reason in the mental health community. Um, people believe that you can only really have one hat and, and wear it um, properly. It's just the way it is right now. So either you wanna write a journal article about it and like expose this aspect of the working world um, or you wanna just keep plow plowing forward and handling other problems as they move along. I chose to expose it, but that was after years. Um, remember we talked about like, what do you take on in terms of change? and change from within. Um, I sent this folks to you. It was uh, the double standard at the heart of peer services. I don't know if you folks could see it. Let's see here. What can we see, John? Oh no. Well, I don't know. We can say you should. You should probably be able to see it. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> oh, you, you, yeah. you see the Man in America article? Yep. All right. So this is an article that I wrote recently that really was like the culmination of years of this sort of like, you know, getting um, plowed over in like, you know, um, mental health settings where like you wear two hats and all of a sudden you're like an enigma and misunderstood and the next thing to walk out the door if a client complains, right? So like, it talks all about how, you know, uh, you know, like colleagues can talk about their messed up marriages, but if a peer does it, you know, then all of a sudden they have personality issues that are, you know, untreated. So like, the point is, there are certain communities out there and, and certain, you know, field placements and certain jobs you'll take where like, you could have more roles and multiple roles in the mental health community, I find it's really bracketed and, and really encamped. Just be aware of that. I can't post in certain in forums on the internet without being reamed out. I remember I posted something in, um, it was a uh, it was an article in uh, Mad Studies. It's this group on Facebook, okay? 200 comments. I never saw so many in my life, anything I've ever written, like about how what I did, why am I writing this? And how can I take it here and in their space? And, and how dare I? And, and I get it. In the mental health community, remember some folks and some patients, they call it the ex-patient movement. Um, some folks were really harmed, right, by doctors. And I don't believe that was always intentional. They just didn't have the right know-how. They didn't know what they were doing. They were walking in the unknown and treating people, right? They didn't have all the, the answers. They didn't have all the medicine. They were trying to heal people, but it didn't work out. Some people were really fucked up and harmed, all right? And um, you have some, some really angry people out there, all right? In these um, ex-patient movements and um, peer movements where, you know, they're still angry. They're still angry. And, you know, that's great, right? Anger can be mobilized and channeled into productive ways, but sometimes it gets unproductive. And I've bounced heads and bumped up against other people, right, in the mental health movement, okay, where they're like, clinician, you're not, you're, you can't speak for us, clinician. I'm like, who is this guy? What does he keep saying this for? The guy was really well known in the mental health reform movement. He did a lot of great things. He got a lot of reforms passed. But he so hung up on me being this dual role that he just doesn't want me to be a part of this community. So I said to him, you know, your anger is great. Uh, I understand why you're angry. 
I understand that you did great things out there, but it's a different world today. I wasn't harmed like you when I went to the hospital, okay? I had good doctors and good meds, and now I'm doing great, all right? Bet you wish you had it that way, right? But you don't and you didn't, and you're still angry. But you know what? I have valuable things to offer this community, and I will offer it to them. And I will be a part of it. And I won't be excluded because of your anger and your history. So you'll bump up, this is, you'll bump up against heads against people out there in your jobs. Whether you're working in mental health, the medical world, you'll have different ideas than the people around you, okay? And you're just going to have to realize that people have their history, right? They have the reasons for thinking what they do. And you have to think around that and above that and say, this is where they're coming from. This is what they need to hear. This is how we're going to work together. And you have to be able to synthesize that and, and really and filter through it and make it work. Um, you know, this poor guy had it real bad. I didn't have it bad. I had that one doc who told me you're going to the hospital and, it, and she was kind of curt, maybe a little sarcastic, right? This guy was like, you know, violated. He was really harmed. That never happened to me. I came up at a different time, a better time. But does that mean what I have to say is any less valuable or more valuable than him? Probably not. Maybe I have things to offer too. Maybe I'm going to help people too. So the point is, in your jobs, in your roles, it's going to be your lived experience that also bumps up against what you have to offer people and what you take out there and what you want to give people. Remember, your message isn't always bound up on your limitations in your history, it's, it's also bound up against, you know, your will to get it out there and overcome these obstacles and, and show people how you did it and how they can do it and make it work for them. Um, yeah, so that's my point. That's what I've done. I've done a lot of research and research along the way um, um, and, and researching on people and, and sort of the world around me. Um, that piece that we talked about earlier that was taken away from me, right? My uh, my coming of age, my sense of identity. I've reclaimed that um, since. And and my goal has since been, you know, to take that reclaiming and make something of it, right? I have a good sense of myself now. I'm not running around applying for graduate school on a whim, taking all these credits over the winter. I have a really good idea of what I want for myself and what I want for the world. And... Part of being a prosumer is that that sh being sure of yourself and be knowing what you want and 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 making it work for you and and taking that sense of confidence and instilling it in your clients and the people around you because the people around you have to believe in you that's how it is that's how it is your clients have to believe in you your supports have to believe in you because if everyone starts disbelieving in your integrity and in your and in your and your ethics who's going to rally around you and who's going to listen to anything you have to say or want to do anything you have to say folks you have to take it to that next level all the time level up level up at all times know how to get there and and i wish you the best in getting there and and hope you do in the least tragic and most fortunate way and i guess that's where i'll leave it um I don't take any questions at this point. Any last questions? A uh, couple of questions that have come up. Uh, could you talk a little bit about being a peer? Is there additional certifications in New York State? What does that look like? Yes. So, so, um, so being a peer, you know, anyone can really be a peer with lived experience. Um, you could be a bricklayer and have a mental health disorder and become a peer. So now. Recently, in the past five or so years, uh, the state has come up with a certification, okay, um, through um, the Academy of Peer Services, it's called, where you take some courses online um, and you basically like, it's basically preliminary, preliminary engagement work, engaging with people, learning a little bit about the peer movement, learning a little bit about yourself, um, and then like there's an internship involved. Um, and then you go out and you do the work. Um, there is a, so you folks know a history. Now remember peers and 
becoming this whole peer idea of becoming a peer and there being peers only became a thing from people like that guy who didn't like me, right? Um, who like called me youth clinician. He sort of paved the way and folks like him paved the way for there to be peers. And one flew of the cuckoo's nest, he didn't have a peer, right? Or Ratchet didn't yell at the peer, no. He, there wasn't some guy there who was better and just hanging out and helping people. No, that's, that's the work of a lot of reformers. Now, there's a lot of talk about how um, through the Academy of Peer Services and the agencies, they sort of co-opted the, the true idea of a peer. So for example, uh, state local mental health boards and you know local mental health um, units have peers now. And the idea is if, well, if you're a peer working for the government for OMH, you really a peer, or you just co-opted into this, you know, the, this, the, the speak of, you know, the Office of Mental Health, right? If you're working for the Office of Mental Health, how could you possibly be a true peer and a true advocate? Because in the end, aren't you just going to do what the state says you have to do? So like, you know, there's that social justice piece to it too. So I just want to make you folks aware that there's a, a rich history there of co-optation and, um, and reform. So uh, people take it very seriously. Um, so it's there, yeah. Uh, another question for you, Max. What happens if a client that you're seeing as a professional sees or finds your blog or lives about or learns about more of your li lived experience? How do you handle that? Is that a boundary violation in your view? Folks have found my blog, um, you know, um, Generally, I mean, like, think about it this way. Who are you working with? So, like, I worked a lot um, when I was for an agency with, like, kids, adolescents and kids. Like, nine-year-olds weren't looking up my blog, right? You know? And when I worked for an act team, these folks were so disordered, they could barely get out of bed. They're not looking at my blog either. Folks that are looking at my blog and are that, writ are that passionate about getting better and learning about me and what I've done, they can look at my blog. I, uh, I would even tell them, you know, good job, you know, what did you learn? Uh, but usually folks that are so sick that, you know, would take the information in a wrong way, they're not looking at the internet and researching you. That's just my belief. Uh, another question for you uh, that, that uh, came through is that with, um, with putting yourself out there and being vulnerable in this level, and then also dealing with something like you've experienced with that gentleman who has had a, a, a rough go of the system and he's kind of directly criticizing you. How do you handle, how do you have the wherewithal to continue putting yourself out there and being vulnerable to groups of people that might flat out reject what you have to say? It's hard, like it's hard because like, you know, we want to be friends with our colleagues, right? A little bit, right? We want to have lunch with them or something or like talk with them, but you know, like think about it this way. Right. And my friend reminds me all the time, like, you know, like, but like, think about it this way. You're doing what you can to feel better, to heal, right? And you're protecting yourself and you're vulnerable. And then all of a sudden, and then you're constantly surrounded by sick people who may not be as healthy or as recovered as you, right? And it's like you get beaten down by them and like you just, just try to have lunch and like, you know, have a conversation. And then they're like, Oh, yeah, Max, well, fuck you. I'm like, well, I didn't deserve that. Why do they say that? And then, like, you're thinking all day, what is it me? Is it me? No, they're just out of their minds. And you know, you know what I mean? Like, and they're not better yet, or they're not healed, or they're not in the place I am. So it's like, you got to keep in mind pretty much all the time, it's about perception. It's not going to be about people, because you could run into anybody with it, and they can have any sort of reception to you. You need to have a perception and uh, an ingrained belief and reinforced belief that if they're not taken and liking what I'm putting out there, then that's okay. As long as, you know, as long as I get home without cuts on me and I can live another day where there was no long-term harm done to me, right? Words were said, that's fine. They perceiving it a different way. Maybe they're not okay. Maybe they had a bad day. Um, I honestly think about it in a way where like, all right, I made it home. I made it home safe. People will say what they think. In the end, 
I have to have a certain belief in myself that, you know, that what I believe is, um, you know, either like more, not more valid, but, you know, my belief is in myself and my story. And if other people are taking away from that, um, I can't let them do that, but I won't let them, um, you know, I won't let them harm me and my identity. So I, I, I generally just try to like stay positive, just tell myself it's okay, it's them, it's not me. And if it is them, I can learn a little bit about why they think the way they do and incorporate that into my day to day. So I don't run into it again or like, I got to know this guy better and what his deal was. So like, I didn't get exposed to that like every day, you know, and not know where it's coming from. So like, you know, you protect yourself in those little ways. And generally if you get home and unscathed and not beat up and you can tell your story another day, then that's all there is to it. You know, you won. I got a, a, a bunch more, but I don't want to take over the time. So I want to make sure that students have uh, an opportunity to ask you some more questions as well. Sure. Keep asking. Right? I guess I'll go again. Uh, so uh, I, I'm curious about, uh, you had mentioned a little bit like um, in some of your, your, your internship experience, your work experience, you had some uh, challenges with maybe, you know, just personnel issues, right? Just personality, you know, clashing. How did you navigate that? And what, what do you think would be helpful for folks to know how to navigate working with somebody you might not get along with? Mm -hmm. just in the social work field in general sure yeah it's, it's about insulating yourself so like you put positive people and positive relationships around you it's like in your everyday life right um and if you have enough positive relationships around you the negative ones have a hard time penetrating that wall right and it's the same thing in the workforce if you're in an agency or setting or a larger like you know, a larger setting with a lot of people, more positive relationships around you, a harder time negative talk and, and pushback gets through. And really, um, that's the way I've learned to do it. Um, it's just finding those positive relationships and nurturing them is what's important. You gotta do that all the time. Remember relationships, like plants, you gotta order them every day. Knowing what you know now, um, as you went through the hospital and uh, your own sort of experience with the mental health services in New York State, um, what do you wish the providers on the other side, the social workers, the psychiatrists would have known to better inform their work with you as, you know, Max in, in um, you know, who was getting that uh, newly admitted unit? Probably to prepare me more for the long term. Um, you know, it's interesting, like, we think a lot, I mean, that's probably caught up and bound with, up in this, like, idea that, like, we're just, like, folks that are so sick are going to fail out or are going to relapse very quickly. But, you know, um, I was dead set on, you know, plowing through the long haul. And I think for a lot of mental, and especially in mental health, we don't teach enough this long-term stuff. So, like, I wrote that article, Intramuscular Injection. It's not just about taking the conversation of adherence out of the picture. It's about taking the week-to-week -week crisis management state and put stabilization and long-term um, treatment and treatment goals into the picture, right? We now have long-term and inject long-acting injectables. Three months. I get an injection once every three months and I'm good. Think of that stability, right? That like a person that would normally throw their meds in the garbage every couple of months would achieve. So like there's all this, the long-term issues involved with uh, from keeping um, stable and, and goal oriented over the long term is what I wish clinicians would have focused more on. Yep. As a, as a clinician yourself, what's your relationship with diagnosing? I know many people have complicated relationships with diagnosis. All right. So what I'll do for that is um, I am just going to punt 
so, so we can get to all the questions. Um, give you an article. That's I on. Um, I wrote an article on diagnosis, and you guys can read that. Um, ah, the screen. Um, that's Maxwell. All my articles, by the way, are on Google Scholar too, but um, I'll give you this article on mental health diagnosis, axioms, and uh, um, I don't know, shit. Oh, yeah, right. This is all about my my interpretation of diagnosis and where it stands. Basically, in not so many words, yeah, certain things share certain commonalities, but others don't, and we have to be person centered. But at the same time, know that, um, you know, diagnosis is what it is. It's going to allow people to talk very quickly, clinicians to speak and align a certain language. And uh, it, it has its benefits, you know. Everything has its benefits and its drawbacks. It's how you use it and apply it in clinical work that makes all the difference, all the difference. And people can tell. People can always tell how you apply it and where you stand based on how you speak and uh, the language that you use. So yeah, let me just give this to you folks and we'll go to the next one. I just don't know where to, ah. John, I can't find the chat name. Uh, it's, uh, it probably is behind your your shared window. I that can. happens to me quite frankly, uh, yeah. quite frequently, yeah. Yeah, there we are. Uh, another question for you that came through uh, from Heather, what drugs are most successful at treating schizoaffective disorder or is that too individual to generalize? Um, well, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty, um, that's a bit of a general thing there, but like, you know, I, I have a belief I love in, I love a really strong belief as you folks have gathered for, about injectables. Um, so it's not in terms of like which particular drug, but the, but the treatment pathway and delivery system that I think is most important. And that's the injection. Yes. The injection um, method become more common? Is that, is that now more? Not so much. Oh. Uh, you know, it's not so much. It's still a lot of folks, I believe, have this idea that, like, it's for non-compliant, it's adherent people, um, you know, um, and a lot of uh, places aren't equipped to, like, you know, do it for a lot of folks, like, for the bulk of treatment. But my doctor's like, what do you want an injection for? I'm like, you don't get it. Um, but, like, the fact of the matter is they are coming out with long-acting injectables for these reasons because they are experienced, people are experiencing the benefits of long, you know, more long-term goal setting and stabilization because there are benefits, um, you know, even in terms of like the drug itself in the system biologically, um, there are benefits. Um, so, you know, I, I would always go for an injection over not. Yes. What else we got? Other questions from folks. So a uh, question from the chat from Kyle, as someone who has shared about your own journey of mental health through your book, how do you feel about gr the growing popularity of other representations of mental health in popular culture, such as books and movies like 13 Reasons Why? I'm not too familiar with 13 Reasons Why, but I can't speak to Joker. Can I do that as an example? Yeah, sure. um, I can tell you that at first, when I first saw the movie, I walked out, not because I was angry, at like the way it was represented, but because it was that like triggering, like I wasn't like wiling out, but like, I was like, ah, oh, ah, oh. I remember seeing, I remember what really got me was um, the two things was the social worker, like therapist 
like talking with him and this like sort of apathy and this, um, you know, very cold treatment setting. Um, it was like, oh my God, I was like, I'm back in the state hospital. And then when he had passed that sort of like, even though it wasn't, was what it was in terms of reality that when it returned, I thought of my parents and I thought of my mom and I said, how would they have felt if like I had actually like, you know, like hurt somebody and, and went the forensic route instead of like the community, you know, mental health group and that would, how horrible that would have been for them and for me. So that's, that's how I feel. Yeah, and I feel like there's a quite a bit of stigma around people with any sort of mental health issue to be labeled as violent or right. to be, you know, when we know that more likely than not, folks who are diagnosed with mental health are more yeah. likely to be victims of violence. So, yes. Themselves. Yes. yes. Yeah. And, you know, and I wasn't angry so much about like that representation because like, you know, there are people that do hurt people. You know, we do have a forensic unit and part of the system, there are, you know, psychiatric prisons, right? Um, so people do do that. It was just the idea that the precarity of it. And there's this like line where, you know, I've dabbled with like, I've, you know, I've had a lot of stuff I've overcome. But like, if stuff got any worse at certain points, I might not have rallied back the way I did, right? You know, like, I got a little piled high, but it was probably even higher. I don't know. What if I had run out of gas once when I was manic and driving back and forth between here and Canada? Where would I be? You know, where would I be? What if I, instead of, you know, clutching a knife, had shoved it in that that um, professor I was living with, right? My life would have been a lot different, you know? Um, and, you know, and it, it's, it, it, you know, like, it, it just made me sad. I remember sitting there in the movie theater thinking about how that would have impacted all the people around me that either cheered me on or uh, been there for me, how sad they would have been and how tragic it would have been for my life. That's it. My, uh, my guess is that for a lot of folks here, the idea of a prosumer is something that's a new concept so some in, in terms of some takeaways, so for these folks that are going to go out in and practice, probably, you know, follow the footsteps of, of you and be a grad who gets their LCSW and becomes a clinician out and maybe gets their own private practice one day like yourself. Right. What, what, should, what are some solid takeaways you would like them to know so that when they're working with people in the future, this, these are some little tidbits that they'll remember that on, uh, you know, October the 28th at 342, Max told them these things to remember in their private practice careers. Yeah, so um, sure. Uh, in terms of your private practice, right? Um, remember, it's, it's a beautiful thing to have a private practice after like passing through the agency where you sort of have to do everything under the auspices of, you know, their beliefs and how they run things and do things. But it also doesn't mean that, um, you know, you're going to go out there and in your room or that, you know, small space, you, you're going to um, change the way the world works. So you have to remember that when you're on your own, you are on your own in your private practice. You, you don't, you're not relying on the agency's lawyers and, 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 and finger pointing. You have to own everything. And a part of owning everything is knowing your craft and knowing it well and knowing how to filter out problems and, 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 and identifying problems ahead because it's you doing it, right? You don't have a supervisor above you or someone reading your notes that you can't even see in a computer in a room down the hall, right? This is all you. So you have to make sure that you're fully invested in the work and that when you are doing it, that you know, you're problem solving every step of the way and, and able to see the issues ahead, like in your life. Like, for example, you know, um, when you're screening or doing an intake, right? You're gonna say to yourself, all right, you know, um, like, okay. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. you're listening, uh-huh, to the patient, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so, 
this may not be the right setting for you. Um, you know, I know a lot of great providers um, who are going to do excellent work and who do excellent work with what's going on with you. If you're, if something is not your craft or not like your area of specialization or what you do well in, you probably shouldn't do it in your private practice, right? Send it along, pass it along. You're not passing the buck, you're sending them to someone who can really help them. That's, that would be, the, I think, the mm -hmm. most important thing. Yeah. So the buck buck stops with you as the as the clinician. You right. Know, you're the everything. You're the you're the you're the attorney. You're the right. supervisor. You're the executive director, and you're also right. you know the clinician seeing clients. Yes. Yeah. How was today? Was this helpful? Was did was this better? Did folks do you think benefit? Or is that a conversation for later? No. <laughs> Uh, I think I think I saw some heads nod when you asked. Uh, so I, I would say that folks definitely benefited and appreciated your story. I think it's a story that uh, I never heard when I was in the program. I didn't hear it very often beyond, uh, you know, um, different experiences I've had, you know, with, with folks in the community. So I think having it now at this point in their in their uh, MSW is something already that has created change. Um, so hopefully this can inform their practice and their and their future um, opportunities. And I'll, and I'll open it up for any comments that folks have for, for you, for, you know, you spent the last uh, uh, almost three hours with us. You're donating your time, your busy schedule. So we want to thank you. But uh, any feedback you can offer, Max, or I, I know lots of thank yous in the chat. So. Yeah. Uh, Yay. Okay. I will say, folks, if you like the story or want to read more, um, you know, you can check out the book, University on Watch. Make sure you get the remastered edition. All right. Um, and if you or wait, it's also being republished in a couple months um, with another publisher. And if you folks want a um, like a or very eager, don't want to wait for it to be sent to you, I can send you a, a copy. Um, what do they call it? Not, um, just a copy of it electronically. To read and um, you know anything to really get the word out and I think when you read the story you'll see that um, it, it gets serious and life is serious right and we have to take life for what it is because if we're not we're not taking life for what it is and who are we as social workers right who are we who are we identity prosumer oh my god all right great <laughs> Thanks for bringing it back for us, Mac. Uh, and and I want to thank everybody for for taking their time out of their day to join us. And thank you, Max, especially. You. Uh, so if we could like give Max a round of uh, like silent applause or loud applause, I don't know, whatever it looks like in the world of Zoom, um, it, it, you know, that would be roaring applause cool. if you were with us in person, of course. Cool. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody, uh, for this excellent experience. It's always a pleasure to speak with folks out there. Um, who want to, you know, do it a little bit better for themselves and for the community and to learn a little bit about life and its misfortunes and um, tragedies and how to reverse that, alter the course of events and, you know, uh, take things in an all new direction and reach for the stars uh, and never stop looking back. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So, so keep reaching for the stars. I do every day. Don't stop. Because once you stop, you know, it's over. So it's not over yet. So keep going. Students, be well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.